globally. How do we grow this influence of, of uh, black leaders, uh, men and women that can represent our industry inside the ANC, inside the, the policy making structures? Get uh, to grips with the, the digital environment, uh, put together best practices, what works and what doesn't, very importantly. In the project that we're doing in Chatlad, we've created a, a, a linking bridge between those uh, those two little areas there. So it becomes a matter of just 10 minutes walk from one mm. side to the other. So my message to our CEOs and those chief investment officers is where at the end of the day do you want to see your role? So by feeding all of our water back to a stage where we can bring it back into the process, we're in effect saving around about 35% of, uh, of our water usage on site. <laughs> and we are live. Welcome to GreenEconomy.tv. I'm your host and facilitator, Byron McDonald. It's another episode of The Circular Show. And our regular guest, Chris White, director of the African Circular Economy Network, also, we'll be going in conversation with Gordon Brown, Green Economy Publisher Journal. And, of course, we can't forget Nawazi Mbele, the intelligent Nawazi Mbele. But before I go ahead, as I say each week, greeneconomy.tv provide insight and intelligence on all sustainability-related matters. So let's invite on our guests. Hi, Byron. Hey, Gordon. How are you guys doing? Hello, hello, hello. Doing well, thanks. Excellent. Gordon, giving over to you. You guys can go in and get it started. No, thank you very much indeed, Byron, as always. And, uh, and a super warm welcome to, to Nolazi and, uh, and to Chris. So um, since the inception of this particular started off, for those of you who haven't been watching, we started off talking about this idea of circular economy, this body of thought, uh, this uh, professional practice. Uh, how is it structured globally? To what extent is it playing a role globally? To what extent is it playing a role in Africa and indeed in South Africa? And subsequent to that, we've been looking at some of the key sectors and starting to narrow down the conversation and say, how can circular thinking uh, really change how we do things, make how we do things more sustainable uh, and more environmentally intelligent? So. This week and today, we're speaking about circular economy as it can have an impact on residential water consumption. And so uh, without further ado, I'd like to pose this question to Chris. Um, we talk about residential water or, 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 or domestic water consumption. What is the problem? Uh, let's, let's discuss where we are right now in terms of how the systems work. Uh, what is the key problem that you see or problems that you see and how do you how do you see a change towards more circular thinking beginning to solve these problems thanks gordon um i think maybe we need to reflect quickly in terms of what we chatted about last week which, which was understanding the sort of um, circularity in water in general and, and, and understand um from that perspective uh, one of the key issues is that we are a water scarce country um we should be looking at every opportunity in terms of being efficient with water and looking at water reutilization right throughout the system. The problem that we face uh, in this country is that, um, unfortunately, we, we live in a sort of a municipal type system. Uh, most of us pay our rates and utilities uh, and, and our municipalities are buying water from the water boards and then selling it on to us. So we've got to remember first and foremost that um, the, the water losses that we discussed last week are in the region of 40 to 50 percent across many municipalities where water is either lost through leaks or, or stolen. Um, you know, people who are, who are tapping into it without, um, without a proper water, water meter. So effectively what happens is that the municipality's um, income is, is designed and developed around how much water you consume and how much energy you consume. So it's not in their best interests for the home consumer to use less water because they make more money if you use more water. Simple as that. So there's a problem in the system. The system is broken from the top because we're a water scarce country. We should be um, frugal with our uh, water utilization. Uh, and yet we're not. And, and we've seen it 
recently with uh, with the day zero that we had um, almost in, in Cape Town, um, East London uh, is, is in that situation right now, Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, and yet we're not looking after the resources that we have. So I think it's important for us to discuss this um, perhaps in, in more detail as we are this week, looking at the consumer and getting them to understand where they fit into that value chain but also that there is a lot that they can do in terms of their own water utilization um, and, and be more circular in, in terms of their, their own usage and save money, uh, save the planet, save money. It, it just makes sense. So let's focus around those components. Um, if we need to, we can reflect back on you know, where the water is coming from and the amount of infrastructure and energy and power that it takes to get water from you know where it is to where you are um and all those different issues uh it's different yeah, kzn we're blessed with water joburg's got a pipe there's in from from lesotho um yeah it's expensive so we need to be saving water in every different uh, opportunity and, and and many people just don't understand the role that they can play in their own water nexus and and uh, becoming more circular yeah, and absolutely. And I mean, I, I think uh, just uh, being based in Cape Town and having lived through the, the seven-year drought that, we, that we've just been through, uh, a lot of the questions that were arising from disgruntled uh, uh, ratepayers was, you know, why weren't we ready for this? Why didn't we put the systems in place beforehand so that we didn't reach this point, you know? So uh, in the process, I think, uh, you know, certainly a significant of of homeowners rushed out, bought water tanks, invested in uh, in, in all range of um, systems like uh, yeah, not so much rainwater capture, but but yes, rainwater capture as well as as well as grey water and so forth. But perhaps just let's just quickly uh, summarize the the standard approach that let's say a builder or an architect would take to. Uh, to water supply and uh, and disposal in a typical uh, residential property, and, and how can we begin to really rethink that so that it becomes uh, a circular solution? We need to look at it from from uh, as you say from not only the new construction design systems, but we also need to look at retrofitting what we have because it's it's inefficient. So effectively now what should be happening um, is, is an understanding, a key understanding first and foremost with regards to access to water uh, as well as uh, wastewater and water sanitation based systems. Uh, where we are in this country at the moment is that we have our wastewater systems that are, 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 are in a shocking state. Um, we're not uh, operating at 100% capacity, um, most of our wastewater treatment facilities are way over capacity, which means that that um, during high flow periods, the stuff is going straight back into the system um, unprocessed. Um, we pump millions and millions of liters of water a day out uh, to sea from uh, Durban, Cape Town, um, thinking that you know, the, the planet will just be able to sort it out. So the first thing we need to do is we need to look at the design. Uh, and again, this comes to the issue of understanding the offset between where government's coming from and, and where designers are coming from. But fortunately now we have a, a very green-minded um, uh, design uh, sort of scientific professionals, whether they're looking at, at the Green Building Council, um, architects, engineers, um, Essentially now, most big developments are looking at off-grid wastewater treatment systems. So they realize that the existing water treatment systems at municipalities don't have the capacity to bring on, <clears throat> bring on another thousand house unit or whatever. So there's a big push now for off-grid uh, or closed system wastewater treatment works. Um, and that's a great way of going about it. They're far more efficient. Um, they're also able to utilize the, 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 the recovered water from them uh, in terms of irrigation and, uh, and, and local applications. But um, design is also very important now looking at, at, at the housing side of things. Uh, and again, whether you're looking at original design or, or um, retrofitting. 
one needs to look at uh, the, your water storage. Uh, water storage is a critical issue. Um, every house has a geyser, and I don't know about you, but I've been living in this house for 22 years, and I think I've had four geysers burst on me. Um, water storage is just a bad idea. Um, it's inefficient, it uses too much energy, and yet there are systems that bypass that. We have um, uh, heat pump systems that are better than element systems, but then we also have uh, direct um, contact systems, which means that you don't need a geyser. Um, you can literally turn on the power. Uh, it heats up the water as you need it um, without having to store it and, and look at any wastage from that perspective. But in design, houses now also need to look at uh, thinking about it right from the onset. So looking at, at issues like dual flush toilets uh, to save water. Uh, toilets in, in, in a home, most people don't understand, 30% of your water usage is flushed down the loo every day. Um, and yet, yeah, simple things one can do, uh, you know, if it's yellow, uh, let it mellow. Uh, if it's brown, let it down. Um, so, yeah, simple things like that, uh, which might be able to, to reduce your, your usage. But you can also get um, dual flush converters for old toilets, and, and everyone should have them. Uh, taps should have aerators in. Um, tap aerators will save 40 to 60 percent of water. Um, if you look at, at um, your your shower, is another big issue. Again, rather shower than bath, but also put in a um, an eco pulse shower head or a similar sort of water saving device, and those can save up to 60 percent water usage. So these are all very simple things that don't cost much. Um, if you look at retrofitting, you get these little tap inverters. You can go to your local hardware store and buy one for 30 Rand, uh, and each one will save you 60% water usage on, on your tap. Um, but also to, to look at, at maintaining your homes. Uh, very simple thing, if you look at, at a dripping tap, can lose 48 liters of, of water a day, uh, which doesn't sound like much, um, but that's 17,000 liters in a year. So um, look at, at, uh, at making sure that you're frugal, uh, keep look at your maintenance, um, and then from a design perspective or a retrofit perspective, look at those issues. And that, this is before you even start getting into rainwater harvesting and grey water recycling. Um, just design right from the onset or retrofit. Uh, great, but let's let's talk for a moment those issues you, you've just touched on. So let's talk about the source of water. So typically, we just turn on the tap and boom. You know, what other options are there? Because it's actually not that straightforward, is it? I mean, you know, yeah. borehole water, yeah, great, but it's having effect on the communal, you know, water table. Um, yeah, you've got rainwater harvesting. It's fantastic if it's raining, but what if it's not raining? And what about the quality of that water? Um, maybe just talk us through, through that aspect of it. And then possibly, mm. so part of source would also be what comes out at the end that you might otherwise dispose of, that can also be a source of water in a circular system. Maybe talk to us about those sources of water versus council water. No, absolutely. So, again, the first thing one should look at is, is to understand that there's water everywhere. We talked about the water cycle. Uh, water is circular by nature. Um, it falls out of the sky, it runs down our rivers, uh, it goes back into the sea, gets evaporated back up again, and, and it goes in the circle. Um, problem is, is that we tend to mess up that circle and, and, uh, and pollute most of the stuff on the way through. So we've got to change the way we're doing things. But if you look at, at, at uh, boreholes, again, understand from a legal perspective now, nobody own, you don't own the water under your house. Um, that now belongs to the state. So you need to understand there are legal issues around getting boreholes now. So there's a lot of boreholes that are in system already, which people can tap into, and, and those uh, were not part of the, the, the new state laws in, in, in those days. But a borehole is expensive. Um, I looked at one here, um, and, and I'm in Peter Maritzburg, and I was talking about maybe 25 to 30 meter hole. It would probably cost me in the region of 35 to 50,000 Rand um, to look at putting in a unit. And that sounds like a lot of money. I mean, obviously, if you look at your water costs on a, on a, on a monthly basis, um, you'd be able to pay it off in three or four years. But again, you don't know what the quality of that water is. If you're living in an urban environment, what is the, the water quality of that water? And, and I'm pretty sure if, if one looks at the area that I'm in, um, that there's going to be a few problems with that water. Um, so again, you need to understand what's potable and what's non-potable. 
it's perfectly fine to to shower in in, in water that might not be potable but um, uh, again you need to just be able to put those sort of systems into place but rainwater harvesting is something that everybody should do every household should be by law um, made to look at rainwater harvesting again it's not done because it's not in the interests of municipalities who make their money by charging you for water um, so rainwater harvesting is something that everybody can do and and if you're looking at you, your main issues in terms of water usage in the residential environment and your sort of middle upper uh, upper class areas is watering your garden um, washing your cars and filling up your swimming pool and those are massive water wasters um, and this is all water where, where you know we, we are really wasting that water so one needs to be frugal about that and simply by, by being able to use a, a rainwater harvesting system to fill up your, your swimming pool and water your garden is just a much better way of doing things. And again, the technology is there now. Um, you know, one can do things very simply. There are solar panel systems for, for pumping water. Um, one can look at, at additional storage facilities and, and move water from one um, tank into another. So there's many different ways of being able to become more uh, more water wise um, the reality is is that the only water you need from a municipal um, application is is that which you need to drink because you can't drink the rainwater unless you've got your own filtration system which again is quite possible so there are roof-based systems you can get now for i think it's under 200 dollars now which which will take water from your rainwater tanks put it through a uv stabilizer and a ozonation system and provide you potable water into your household. It, 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 all the technologies are there. So uh, one can effectively be off grid uh, in terms of water, but that means that you need to be pretty sure that the rain's gonna fall. Uh, and unfortunately the rain doesn't fall all the time. So you need to also make sure that that, um, that there's a backup and a municipal backup is uh, obviously a great way of, of, of making sure that that you know if, if it does stop raining and you, you end up with uh, a bit of a dry period that you're not then left with uh, with nothing and you know praying for rain but all of those are different elements uh, in terms of being able to uh, look at your sources um, but part of the source can also be what you're throwing away so what happens to your bath water and and your and and your your shower water uh, the water from your uh, dishwashing machine and from your your clothes washing that's all gray water and there are very simple systems one can put in that will separate gray water um, to be absolutely usable for your garden uh, or for washing your vehicles or um, there, there are some systems that are efficient enough you could put that into your swimming pool. Uh, again, I probably wouldn't drink it. Um, but again, don't waste that water. Um, this, the, the strange thing to me is that we, we actually have some of the best potable water available um, from a municipal perspective, um, probably globally, and, and yet we all go and buy water in bottles for drinking. So I don't get it. Um, you know, let, let's, let's use the water that's there. Um, and again, there are some fantastic filtration systems, home-based filtration systems using activated carbon, uh, where if you're really not that keen on, on the, the municipal water, you should be filtering your own water anyway, because there are nasties in that water. You know, there's, there's chlorine and fluorides and, and other bits and pieces. And if you want to be more healthy, then filter your water anyway. So uh, I don't drink water, by the way. It makes me rust. Um, so I stick to beer. Um, but uh, there's all these different elements in terms of looking at your sources. And if one is is able to understand now, a, a rainwater harvesting tank is not an expensive investment. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, a 2,000 liter tank is a couple of thousand rand. A 10,000 liter tank is eight or 9,000 rand. It's not a big investment. But... The offset is uh, is huge, and and what consumers need to do is be mindful. Mm. Take a look at your your rates bill every month. Make sure that that you your <clears throat> your water usage is being calculated properly. But then keep track of that. And I think if a lot of people did what we were saying in terms of retrofitting and said, right, let's look at my water over the last six months, and I'm using X amount of kiloliters, say the household's using 25, 30 kiloliters a month, and then do these different things. Put in your dual flush systems, look at your water aerators, put in the proper showerhead systems, and then measure it again and see the impact. 
And you will see the offset on that in terms of your, your payback on your investment is very, very quick, literally within months uh, in terms of those small systems that, that will save you money. So those are our key issues to, to look at. Um, if you've got a swimming pool, you should have a, um, a rainwater harvesting tank and fill it up with rainwater. We're blessed with plenty of rainwater that, that comes off of our roofs and then it just goes into, into the drains and, and it's wasted. It's gone. So <clears throat> we need to look at that. We need to look at, at um, just being clever around the design and doing the right things. And, and they're not complicated. This is the beauty about circular water. It, it, it's, yeah. it's not something you need a degree to do. It's very easy. Sure. Um, I don't know if I can just shoot, shoot a question there. So, Chris, um, you know, during the drought, we all were well aware to save water. We uh, put our taps off and all these things, especially in the Western Cape. But after that, we, we neglected again. How do you think we can put pressure on government? Because I know we, uh, as humans, as residential users, we need laws and we need more laws. Because if you're paying for something, ugh, I'm paying for it. Um, it's any way I can use it. So how do we put more pressure? I know um, there's certain areas where you get a certain amount of liters of water and then you can't use more than that. But is there any other way that we can put more pressure on government to have stricter laws on these things so we don't have these future problems? Do you think there's any solutions on doing that? Absolutely. I think if we look at, at, at a pricing system, we need to <clears throat> be able to say, right, um, first of all, we need to look at the disconnect between government making money out of water. Um, that, that, that's a big issue. But they can still make money out of water because, as you say, there are going to be some people who are going to use more water. So then charge them. So then we look at the, the, the scale. So let's make sure that the first six kiloliters in terms of our own sanitation and health are, are looked after. Um, and those are, that's charged at, at, a, at a very nominal rate. Your next 10 kiloliters should be charged at a high rate. Um, mm -hmm. And if you go over that, then you should be looking at, at a super rate. And that would stop people, um, again, you know, if, they hit it, if they feel it in their pocket, they're not going to be washing their car and filling up the, the swimming pool um, if they're paying 20 rand a litre for water. Um, yeah, it, it's going to change their mindset very quickly. So there's two different ways of doing it. Um, it would be an incentive base, um, which is not working in terms of government's favour at the moment because they want to make money. Um, and then there's the penalty base, which is is look at that proper structure where people are going to think, the consumer is going to think a hell of a lot harder about saying, okay, well, it's raining now, so the dams are full, I can use as much water as I want. No, we've got to stop that. Um, because what people don't realize is that the population is growing all the time. The infrastructure requirements and the maintenance requirements in terms of our water infrastructure are growing continuously. And we need to put in new dams and new facilities and new boreholes and, and new desalination plants to try and meet that demand all the time. And yet we should be decreasing our demand, not increasing our demand. So government can play a role in that. And there is a way if we look at a scale system that they are not going to be out of pocket. Um, but it also is, is a way to encourage your consumers to be a little bit more mindful um, of, of, of that cost. And have a super rate, you know, really. I mean, if, if you've got a household that is using more than um, 100 kiloliters a month, there's a problem there. Um, then then you nail them, 1,000 rand a, yeah, a kiloliter. And, and you're going to see things change very quickly. Uh, so we've got to look at all those different systems. Yeah, I don't know about uh, I don't know about you, Chris, but I'm pretty tired of being told what to do by government. But uh, anyway, that's that's just me. Uh, now, Wazi, I'd like to bring you in here at this point. Uh, have you got a question for Chris? I actually do. I think it's a grade five question, though. But okay. Uh, so, Chris, you mentioned um, using grey water for gardens and everything. Won't that have a negative impact since it contains? Um, detergents? Not really. Um, that's just a case of being mindful in terms of what you're doing. I mean, I think uh, uh, Gordon and I chatted about this before the show started. Um, it's actually a good thing because, it, again, it changes the mindset to becoming a little bit more mindful about the environment. So stop using chemical detergents. Go to organic detergents. Mm. Um, and, and immediately the, the effect is, is going to be a neutral in terms of using that, that in your gardens. We should all be doing that anyway. Um, the chemicals that come down uh, our, our wastewater systems are pretty nasty. 
Um, and, and the reality is, is, that, is that the ineffectiveness around some of our wastewater treatment works is because we have a whole bunch of these chemicals and pollutants that are in the water. Understanding that wastewater treatment works with microbes. Um, so we're flushing jick down the toilets that's actually killing the microbes in, in, in the, the water mitigation systems. So it does make people think more about going organic and using more uh, environmentally friendly products. Um, and yes, they are a little bit more expensive at the moment, but as we see demand grow, uh, supply and demand will, will show that those prices will come down the more people that use it. So I would say um, people would need to understand that, but these gray water systems are pretty functional. They, they can separate out a lot of the nasty bits and pieces. Um, then just use the right soaps, use the right detergents. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I can uh, just attest to that. I've moved into a house now with uh, with a full grey water system, and the overspill water is used to irrigate the grass, and it literally just comes on whenever it's uh, whenever it's ready or when it's uh, got the right volume in the tanks. But of course, if we if we don't use organic uh, uh, hair products and uh, uh, cleaning products and so forth, what happens is that water that water gets affected and it smells bad and it's bad for the plants. So, you know, this is just another example of circularity where one has to understand the cause and effect of what we do. Um, so I'd like to just talk about one more thing as it affects uh, those of us privileged enough to live in, in what we might regard to be regular houses with gardens and, you know, using a lot of water and taps and baths. And I want to talk about the, 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 the the lives of people who don't have access to, to running water, or certainly not running water within their own homes. But just chat replanting and sensible planting and the effect of uh, uh, not planting responsibly on water use. We're running out of time here, I see. Maybe just touch on that, but maybe just give us one sense from your side as to uh, what we can even learn from people who, who really treasure water because they have to actually go and fetch it from where else, uh, from down the road and how we can apply that in our own homes. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we've got to be fair and understand that, that, that we have the haves and the have-nots, and the haves should be fair to the have-nots. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is, that, is that we are, are blasé with our water usage. Uh, gardens are, are, are a bigger story in terms of circularity, so it's not just a case of, of planting indigenous plants uh, and water-wise plants. It's also um, very useful in terms of understanding biodiversity within within the urban environment um, and and um, the opportunities in terms of, of uh, again without these foreign plants that we keep putting in our roses and everything else that we have to keep spraying aphid spray with because they're they're, they're, they're not supposed to be here um, that's that's why they get chomped um, so we need to be able to look at, at making sure that 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 we plant indigenous uh, it's great for biodiversity. Um, every household, if you have the luxury, should have a beehive. Um, you know, these are certain things that we need to look at. Uh, but plant indigenous, water-wise, we are blessed in this country with um, in the Cape Feinbos with with the really water-wise plants, um, and throughout South Africa with uh, our aloes and cacti and succulents. Um, I've converted half of my garden now, and it's beautiful at the moment because in winter. I get all of the aloes are coming up and uh, I, I've got this flurry of white and, and yellow and, and red flowers in the middle of winter. And that's great for the bees and the birds. And, and I've got the, these beautiful sunbirds that come there. So plant wise, um, don't plant some exotic plant because you don't know, first of all, if, if it's if it's um, uh, invasive. Um, take all the invasive and the, the, the exotic stuff out of your garden, put local stuff in, and, and you don't have to water it. It's brilliant. Well, what a pleasure. Thanks for that insight. Uh, I, I, I just know that I've hogged all the questions again this week, so sorry to Nalwazi, sorry to Byron, uh, but thank you very much indeed to, to both of you, but most importantly, and of course, uh, to, our, to our special guest Chris White and, and sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, so as always, as always uh, we'll be back again next week for, a, for another show talking about circularity. Uh, we'll decide uh, in the next day or so what exact topic we'll focus in on that on the website. So please have a look out for that. In the meantime, uh, thank you to Wazi and to Byron as always. Have a great week ahead.
and bye for now. Thank you very much indeed. Bye, everyone. Really, how do we grow this influence of of uh, black leaders, uh, men and women that can represent our industry inside the ANC, inside the, the policy making structures? Get uh, to grips with the, the digital environment, uh, put together best practices, what works and what doesn't, very importantly. In the project that we're doing in Chatmar, we've created a, a linking bridge between those uh, those two little areas there. So it becomes a matter of just 10 minutes walk from one side to the other. So my message to our CEOs and those chief investment officers is where at the end of the day do you want to see your role? So by feeding all of our water back to a stage where we can bring it back into the process, we're in effect saving around about 35% of our, uh, of our water usage on site.